Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your patience. I'm Harold Holzer, the director of Roosevelt House. And on behalf of Hunter President Jennifer Rabb, who's in the house between engagements, welcome, as always. Um, we, we are grateful for those of you who are able to join us in person and grateful uh, and uh, welcome those who are joining us on Zoom, is on Zoom tonight for an event uh, marking the latest triumph by our esteemed Roosevelt House Advisory Board member and friend, Stan Litow. Um, Stan, thank you. Welcome back to Roosevelt House. I think you've done two books since we had our last Board of Advisors meeting, so you are our inspiration. I'm not going to, um, to introduce him because that honor is uh, being given tonight to another very special guest. Um, and it is a pleasure to welcome him back. Um, at least he's making his second appearance at Roosevelt House that I'm aware of if you include his virtual appearance um, at a borough president's debate hosted by Roosevelt House where he wowed the crowd. Um, and um, now he is part of a long history of, uh, he is our borough president-elect, if you didn't get that uh, from implicitly from what I was saying. Um, and Mark Levine is going to be but the latest borough president who has some involvement uh, or, or um, record of attendance here at Roosevelt House. It actually goes back in a way to Constance Baker Motley, not because she visited, although she may have, but she uh, was a Columbia Law School pal of Bella Abzo, class of 1942, my one-time boss. So that's the beginning. But you know, David Dinkins and Virginia Fields and uh, Scott Stringer and Gail Brewer have all been habitués of Roosevelt House. And Mark, we hope you will be here often. Um, and uh, we want to congratulate you on, uh, on your victory uh, and your last uh, four weeks as a member of the New York City Council before you go down to Borough Hall. Um, in this challenging moment, I think we all feel a great sense of confidence that you're going to be the leader of this most important part of the world, in a way. So please welcome our Borough President-elect, Mark Levine. Well, thank you for that very generous introduction. It is wonderful to be back here at Roosevelt House. I'm going to keep the tradition going. Can't, can't, uh, can't let down Constance Baker Motley, one of my favorite predecessors. Uh, I, w I should expect you would know such trivia. Um, Roosevelt House plays such an important role for this city as, as an engine for ideas and a venue for dialogue. And we've always needed you, but I think we need you now more than ever. The scale of the challenges facing Manhattan and New York City is um, arguably the greatest in our lifetime, uh, perhaps only second to the days after 9-11. But on, on so many fronts, uh, obviously public health, the economic shock, the deep inequality revealed and, and exacerbated over the past uh, year and three quarters, and underlying challenges that, that demand our attention, like in education, educational equity. Um, it's all on the line right now with a whole new crop of leaders taking office come January. Um, the most diverse city council in the city's history, 30 women. And um, uh, we have a good crop of borough presidents, too. Four of the five of us served together in the council uh, and are good friends and colleagues. We got a little bit of an issue out there on Staten Island. Am I allowed to be partisan here, or is that a... Uh, uh, there's probably not a lot of Trump supporters in the room, uh, so we have one, one Trump supporting uh, borough president. There's probably going to be a lot of r letters written by four of the five borough presidents, uh, but we'll, we'll see if we can bring him in. Um, I am so pleased to say a word or two about uh, my dear friend Stan, Stan Litau, um, who I go back at least 15 years with. Um, when we were all involved in a great nonprofit that is extremely well represented here tonight. Uh, it was the After School Corp, um, uh, now known as Expand Ed. And the founder is here, Lucy Friedman, who's amazing, and Mary Bleiberg, one of the early, give them big rounds of applause, all of them, um, who hel helped nurture me at an earlier stage in my career and um, taught me a lot about education policy. Uh, here in New York City, and um, and we, we, we always knew Stan was something special, uh, quite often the smartest guy in the room, and has come to be 
uh, really revered for his work in education and specifically P-TECH. And, um, and I am just thrilled uh, to say uh, a little more of a formal introduction uh, so I don't leave out any of the uh, important details. Um, Stan is uh, currently a professor at Duke and Columbia. We're gonna see if we can get you a Hunter College uh, professorship, just a little more prestigious. Uh, and he's an innovator at, in residence at Duke and a trustee at, of the State University of New York, uh, a board member here at Roosevelt, or an, an advisory board member here at Roosevelt House, uh, previously served as president of the IBM Foundation, deputy chancellor of schools for New York City, and a member of several presidential commissions, as well as a member of the Albert Shanker Institute of the American Federation of Teachers. Um, and he's written not one, but two books, I believe. Is that right? And we're gonna hear more about that shortly. Um, but I'm thrilled that also joining us on today's program uh, is Rana uh, Forhar, who is a uh, journalist with the Financial Times and a regular commentator at CNN a resident of our fine city, unfortunately Brooklyn, won't hold it against her. Um, and, and she, while at Time Magazine, got to know the P-TECH story, uh, visited the Brooklyn campus, the Chicago campus, and I remember that story, uh, a cover story, I think, in Time Magazine, which uh, was, was one of the first moments when the world really began to understand uh, the, the power of the model. And so thank you for telling the P-TECH story and for being here today uh, for this panel discussion. And thanks to all of you for coming out. I know you're gonna be absolutely wowed by these two speakers and more importantly by the P-TECH model. Uh, thank you for having me as part of the program and uh, I look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks to those who are on Zoom, which I understand are many. And um, thanks, Stan, to you for having me come and chat with you about a story that I care really deeply about. Um, uh, as we heard earlier, I did a, about 10 years ago now, I think it was 2012, a cover story for Time Magazine um, about PTEC. And it was, uh, I, you know, I spent months actually, um, both at the school in Crown Heights, who's in the but the uh, principal, Rashid Davis, is here, and he's incredible, and I'm gonna talk more about you in a minute and embarrass you, so, you know, get ready. Um, <laughs> and I spent uh, some time also with the schools in Chicago, but since then, they're everywhere. You're, you're in how many states now? 13 states. Okay, 13 states, you're, you're overseas. We're gonna talk all about the growth, but the thing that I'll just start with that, that made perfect sense to me was that this was a school that not only gave kids a really strong education in, in the basics, in literature, math, science, all the things that you need, but it also gave you a job at the end of it if you wanted that. Um, six in four, uh, you get an associate's degree, you also get a high school degree, but one of the things as I was interviewing Rashid and seeing the very first class actually of, of kids going through, is that the model was moving faster than that. And so a lot of them were actually um, getting that work done within four years. And so it, it was just like, wow, we're reinventing high school. You're reinventing high school. Um, and this was actually coming on the heels. I think the, the reason that I found you and heard about this was that I had had some discussions with IBM executives. Um, and I'd asked them, what is your biggest long-term challenge? And they didn't say Apple or China, they said, the mid-market skills gap locally. And here you are, Stan, the man that fixed that. So I guess maybe what we could start with is, how'd you get the idea? Well, I mean, back in coming out of the 2008 recession, uh, Mike Bloomberg was the mayor of New York and was saying to the chancellor at the time, Joel Klein, what are you doing about connecting education to jobs? We need to find opportunity for young people to have the right skills. So uh, uh, Chancellor Klein mentioned that to our CEO at the time, Sam Palmisano, and said, we'd like to help, and I'll have Stan come up with some way to help. Uh, he knew I was Deputy Chancellor of Schools, so I had an opportunity to sit down, and I said, major companies like IBM and others are not gonna hire students with a high school diploma. Those days are gone, so we're gonna have to find a way to come up with a new model 
to get larger numbers of kids a college degree and the skills that they need. So I sat down and I wrote what this program might look like, a combined high school community college uh, program, and I sent it in to the chancellor who asked, would it be okay to share it with the mayor? And I said, yes, absolutely, and s let's sit down and discuss it. And as I wrote in the book, uh, he announced it on TV on Sunday. So then we were off and running, <laughs> and uh, the program actually had to begin because we actually had to deliver on this new model. Right. You know, one of I, I remember when I interviewed you extensively for that piece and others subsequently, we've actually done um, uh, work in the Financial Times about the PTEC model as well, in part because it's being adopted in other countries now, and it's just... It, the problem, the challenge, is so universal. This idea that there is a mid-market skills gap, um, education is, um, you know, not not bridging that. It's bifurcated. It's um, expensive in many places, particularly in the U.S. Um, and and so this is becoming really a worldwide issue. But I remember asking you, okay, how did you navigate all the not only technical challenges, but I think. I don't know if you would say it was more at that time, it feels like it was to me, this sort of um, little bit of a cultural barrier of uh, companies in schools. Because I remember coming and I had a little bit of a prejudice maybe yeah. even about that. And you explained to me, you know, the sort of interaction between your work with the city and what you were doing to IBM. So maybe talk a little more about that and how you overcame some of these issues. Yeah, I, I, it's a three-way partnership. It's, it's the community colleges, it's the school system, and it's the private sector. And yes, there are a lot of people who are very skittish about getting the private sector engaged and involved in education uh, or in any kind of public enterprise because there have been lots of examples where that hasn't worked out so well. And I think it was, imp it was important that the private sector partners needed to understand what your role is. It's a supportive role. The private sector is not developing a different curriculum. The curriculum that exists in all of the schools is exactly the academic curriculum. What the private sector is providing is mentors for every child. They're providing paid internships. They're providing structured workplace visits. And they're learning that if you want to get change, you have to listen and you have to be a collaborator and a full partner. And the same is true of the community colleges. You know, we had lots of young people who get a high school diploma and everybody makes an assumption high school diploma equals college readiness, but actually only 30% of the students who are low income and children of color who register in a community college complete. They need more college readiness. They need more support and preparation. So each one of the partners needs to understand that this is a collaboration. You bring your best skill and talent to the table, but you're not running the show. And this is an opportunity to develop a new model by getting people to collaborate and work together in a different kind of way. What was your biggest challenge along the process from, from the time that this announcement was made in, on TV to the time that you opened the first school? Well, I think the biggest challenge was to go on from the idea of a, a grade nine through 14 combined high school uh, community college into a structure that would really work. So there had to be a scope and sequence of courses where the high school courses and the college courses were connected. We needed to find a great leader, and that's where Rashid Davis came from. Uh, we had to make sure that no key stakeholder was left out. If you look at the most innovative kinds of reforms, they fall apart when key stakeholders are not at the table. So teachers union, principals union, civil rights organizations. It wasn't an example of you know, charter schools where people are ultimately going to be opposed to it because right. they weren't part of how you develop it. Everybody was in the tent. Everybody was part of the development and the design. And this wasn't about starting one school, even from the first time that the school opened, the idea was, if you look in New York City, there's lots of examples of the best schools, but they don't go to scale. And if you go to every city in the United States, somebody could take you to a great school. But scalability and getting it to be able to be uh, something that is not just one successful school, 
but dozens of them. So the plan to replicate almost started from day one. Could other employers be involved? This can't be branded just one company. How do we get more companies, more colleges, and really spread it almost from the beginning? The idea was this isn't beginning and ending on Albany Avenue in Brooklyn. This is something that is going to become a global model. Well, that's interesting because I remember actually even at the time when it was, it was IBM, but I think you already had some other tech companies involved. And then when I started looking at Chicago, I remember there were a lot of healthcare companies involved because that was the interest. So do you find, do you, do you go in and, you know, when you launch a new city or a new state, kind of immediately start looking at that, that gap of where is the need employment-wise, where is the educational system? Like, talk a little bit about how that works in the red states and the blue. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, very often there's an interest from a governor. Uh, governor Raimondo, who's now our Secretary of Commerce, was the governor of Rhode Island. She convened at the governor's office uh, businesses across the state of Rhode Island, and they committed to beginning, you know, a program in a number of schools in Rhode Island and then growing it there. Governor of Connecticut did the same thing. Governor of Colorado did the same thing. So they bring together the best business talent. Uh, they convene the education leadership. And it's don't leave anybody out. Begin it with the idea that everybody plays a role at developing the model. And large numbers of businesses are interested. When you look at it right now, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of businesses that are partnering and collaborating with P-TECH schools. I was in Colorado last week. Uh, they just launched a new uh, P-TECH school in uh, cyber. And the business partners are Comcast, Cisco, and they're all pledging to do the same kinds of things. Uh, they're also starting a new P-TECH school in biotech, and they'll all be in the healthcare area. So there are green jobs P-TECH schools, there are healthcare, uh, the one that launched just in uh, Staten Island, uh, which was the only borough left out uh, in New York City that didn't have a P-TECH school, and the business partner is Northwell Health. Interesting. Um, I have to, since you mentioned Rashid, I have to just pick up and say, um, I spent a lot of time in Rashid's school, and I actually looked at it. Um, I have a 15-year-old son. We put it on our on our list, in fact, for the city, you know, in the city lottery. Spent a lot of time there, and something that really struck me early on is how you had made this your personal life mission to make this school work, whatever it took, and that you were so. I just have to tout Rashid for a minute. You were so attuned, not just to the educational needs of the kids, but what are their other challenges? What might be going on? And I remember you talking about how some of the kids lived in spaces where they didn't have a quiet place to, to study or to learn. Okay, we're going to figure out how to keep the school open longer. We're going to figure out how to you know, make things work. And there was just such a mindset of that. And the kids picked up on it. I have to also talk about um, seeing the workplace learning class, which really blew me away. So workplace learning is one of these classes that I think um, you know, came out of this unique business collaboration, and you watch these kids um, working to actually start their own businesses. They're part of national and international groups, you know, it, that many schools do this and use it as a way of learning, but it was fascinating to me, and to, you know, I'm, I'm sure all of you that live in this world, this corporate world, a world of, of a certain kind of manners and, 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 and poise that you have to put forward, to see these kids learning how to do that with each other, not just learning, you know, the math of this or the writing part of this, but, all right, gosh, you know, nobody likes my idea right now. I'm the CEO. How am I going to, you know, turn the tide here? How am I going to, ch you know, change minds, win, win hearts here? And to see that in real time um, was really, really fascinating. I think it's also important to note that there's no screen for admissions into any of the P-TECH schools. There are 200... Uh, almost 280 of them now, all around the world in 28 countries, 13 different states, but there's no admission screen, no test to get in, no examining your grades. And consequently, by letting every student in, you're serving a low-income population, you're serving students of color, many of them far behind in grade eight. And one of the students I wrote about in the book, Oscar Tendilla, Oscar was almost three years behind in grade eight. Uh, immigrant kid, uh, not doing well, never thought he would complete high school, 
and he gets into P-TECH and click, the mentoring, the support, the workplace learning, and the next thing you know, Oscar completes the six-year program in three and a half years, gets a full scholarship to Cornell, just graduated with his bachelor's degree, and Oscar's mission in life now is to be like Rashid. He wants to be an education reformer. And if he hadn't had that opportunity, the open door, uh, all around New York City and all around the United States, we're struggling with the fact that many of our schools are more segregated than anybody would have imagined they would be in the 21st century. And the P-TECH schools are all open enrollment. I w as I mentioned, I was in Colorado, uh, in Longmont, Colorado, which largely serves an immigrant population from Mexico, and a young man, Jose, who started in the program, again, when he came to the United States, and he was nine years old, he didn't speak a word of English, way behind. He also finishes the six-year program in four years. He just got a full scholarship to Harvard. So all of your assumptions about who can succeed and who can't succeed get out the door because anybody who wants in gets in. And the minute that they start in the school in the ninth grade, they're told, whether in Chicago or in Brooklyn or in Texas, you're in college and we're going to support you and you can succeed. And when you look at the college completion rates in Rashid's school, they're 400% higher than the national average. So the students are not dropping out. They're not just taking a college course. They're winding up with a degree and they have the option of taking high-paid jobs with the associate's degree or going on to get a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, and we have the first student on his way to medical school. We have the first student getting a PhD. The, th this, every assumption about students based upon their zip code or race go out the door if you give them a real opportunity. So are you having discussions, or maybe tell us about some of the discussions policy-wise, given that you are really kind of reverse engineering high school here. You know, you've taken, okay, you get the associate's degree, but what, what this is showing is we can do high school differently. Do you think this is going to become a national model? Um, is it, you know, w I know when Obama was in office, you were having some of those conversations. Where are they now? Um, well, I think this is the opportunity to say th this went from one school to dozens of schools to hundreds of schools serving you know, over 100,000 young people. But that's not nearly enough. And we are, we, if we were in a crisis coming out of the recession in 2010, in the midst now of COVID, the crisis has hit crisis 2.0. This year, we had the largest decline in community college enrollment in America's history. We lost 500,000 students out of our community colleges. So in a state like California, there are 300,000 fewer students going to community college. And what that means is they're not going to have a middle class wage. Uh, if a young person gets a post-secondary degree, they're going to earn 84% more over their lifetime. If you get an associate's degree the first year in the workforce, on average, you're going to earn $5,400 more. So by young people going into the workforce with a high school diploma, they're going to earn minimum wage. Uh, they're going to be in a lot of trouble economically. If we get them the associate's degrees, the sky's the limit. So the imperative for P-TECH now is greater than it was. And we have large numbers of employers who are struggling to find people with the right skills. They're making pledges to diversify their workforce and hire more people of color. But if we don't fix the pipeline and have more people with the education and skills, it's not going to work. So right now, I think the imperative is even greater. When, when Barack Obama came to New York and visited the P-TECH school, he said, this model should be provided to every student in America. And he was right. And this is the opportunity to go from hundreds of schools to thousands of schools the state of Texas has almost 100 P-TECH schools, and they're using their federal money under COVID 
to expand the number from 100 to 200, every state should do the exact same thing because more students with a high school degree uh, into the workforce are not going anywhere. More students with a college degree and the workplace skills that you need are gonna get jobs. They're gonna go on and get four-year degrees and they're gonna pay more in taxes and it's going to be in the economic interest of everyone. So this is the opportunity to go from 13 states to 50 states, to go from hundreds of schools to more. This is an initiative that started in New York City and now there are P-TECH schools in Singapore, Taiwan, Brazil, France. The president of France, President Macron, four months ago got up and said, P-TECH should be provided to every student in France. He said virtually the same thing that Barack Obama did. And he said, I am committed to spreading this model across France. Do we really want to have it spread every place in the world and not in the United States? We developed the model here, it works. Not one student in a P-TECH school anywhere in the United States has taken one remedial class. Do you know that how much remedial classes cost us last year? $12 billion. So you wanna save the money? Do it right. Um, I want to give folks a chance to join in the conversation. Um, and if, you, if you're if you on Zoom, you can funnel your questions through and someone here will ask them. And while you all are thinking um, about questions, let me just ask Stan one or two more. Um, what needs to happen at this point to take the next step to make, to, you know, to get this in every state, um, to increase replicability? What, what do you see as the big challenges? Well, it's important to know that the P-TECH school doesn't cost a nickel more than any other high school. You're not, this is not about philanthropy. This is not about increasing the budget. So it doesn't cost a nickel more. On the other hand, while the students are on the high school register, they're taking college courses. So they have to cover the tuition. So right now, states cover the tuition. In New York State, it's covered by the uh, uh, state budget. Uh, to pay the tuition costs. The same is true in Colorado, the same is true in Texas, other states. So if you want to uh, get this thing to the next level, the states have to cover the tuition costs. And one opportunity at the federal level is we have Pell Grants for students who are financially eligible, but you can't access a Pell Grant when you're taking college courses on the high school register. So all you'd have to do is have the secretary permit that and Pell Grants would be permitted, so that would decrease the cost for states, and that would be a huge opportunity. Second, a company like IBM is paying uh, the cost of all the paid internships. So is Thomson Reuters, so is uh, Corning, so is Global Foundries and many other companies. But there are many mid-sized companies that would provide those paid internships, but they might need some support for it. The Federal College Work Study Grant provides 70% of the wages of low-income students who work to earn money while they're in college, same thing. You just have to sign it off. The secretary could allow a federal college work-study grant to go to those students. Those two actions on a federal level would decrease some of the cost and would make it easier for states to expand the program. But, but you know, when you talk about something and that's innovative like P-TECH, you just need the will to do it. You need to get governors, you need to get the President of the United States, you need to get leaders throughout the private sector and public sector to say, you know, this new model of education works and we want to do it. You know, there was a time when high school wasn't mandatory in America. We only made high school mandatory at the end of the Second World War. Some southern states didn't do it until the 1960s. So. We made a major change, and you could argue that that major change led to economic growth across the United States, so the P-TECH model may be the opportunity to give us the economic growth that we need now for all young people, not just some. It seems like a really important time, too. I would just add, given that the economy is changing so radically to keep job creators and educators in really close touch with each other because there's you know we're going to have a whole new geography of work um, and we don't know quite what it's going to be but you're going to need people with those kinds of skills um, let's open it up and we have a question back here 
regarding the school itself, how does it necessarily come about? Is you use the examples of Brooklyn. Um, is that something that's locally initiated? The second question that I had is in regards to the admissions, is there demand that exceeds the visible spaces? And if there is, how do you deal with that so all the people that would like to have that opportunity can have that opportunity? And third, are the um, companies that sponsor the particular programs, does the students actually end up with actual jobs at those particular companies in the end? Well, the answer to the first question is that the school can open within a school, so you don't have to open a new building. In Chicago, they did that. It, it's a brand new building, and the entire school is P-TECH, but most of the P-TECH schools around the country are a school within a school model, so a cohort of 50 or 100 students can begin in grade nine and expand in that building, so it doesn't require building a new building or leasing a new building, zero cost, to, to start a P-TECH. And I'll give you an example. In the city of Dallas, Texas, every single comprehensive high school in the city of Dallas has a P-TECH school within a school in it. They have an enrollment of 9,000 P-TECH students, and last spring, 1,000 of them got a high school diploma and a community college degree in the same month. Now, will employers hire? Thomson Reuters in Dallas took 28 students and had them doing their internships, they extended job offers to 23 of the 28 students. Tesla is the partner of the P-TECH school in Buffalo, a very small school within a school, 17 graduates. They offer jobs to 15 of the 17. IBM is hiring, Corning is hiring, Global Foundries. So the, the employer makes a pledge and signs off to say that students will be first in line for an interview for any available job. And then they wind up hiring, and the large numbers of the students are low income and children of color, first generation college goers. So there's no barrier standing in the way. One of the reasons I titled the book about P-TECH, Breaking Barriers, because you eliminate the barrier in the design. So any student gets in, you don't just prove that it only works for the highest achievers. You don't spend a huge amount of more money, so people can't s say, well, we can't expand it because we can't afford it, because you can afford it. And you have an opportunity to go to scale because there's nothing about the model that only succeeds in an urban district. The school in Newburgh, New York, which is not a very big city, it had the highest crime and drug rate in New York State, that school represents two-thirds of the cybersecurity graduates for SUNY Orange. And again, low-income students uh, who other people thought wouldn't succeed. There are P-TECH schools up by the Canadian border in New York State uh, with the partners are all small and mid-sized companies. So there's no barrier to expansion. Are you finding a situation where the demand uh, exceeds yes. the actual P school? And how are you dealing with that, with those people lining up to want to get in that particular P school, and it's just not there, or they don't have the capacity? Well, they don't have the capacity, so the only solution is to start more P-TECH schools. That's the policy challenge for our leaders in states across the United States. As I use the example of Texas, you know, following New York's model, they have an RFP that they send out to the state of Texas. It's the same RFP that was developed in New York State. They just changed from New York to Texas. Th it's growing all over the United States and it's growing all over the world. There's no barrier. There is the demand. There is the opportunity. More and more employers would be interested. We just have to make a pledge to do what Barack Obama and President Macron and others have said, this is an opportunity that should be provided to all students. Question over here. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Stan, of course, for your insight as always. Um, I had a question more globally. I think the success of programs like P-TECH has resulted in sort of the, uh, the thought process of higher education of what does it mean to get a college degree. And, sort of how we could reevaluate maybe the traditional 120 
credit course requirement to get your bachelor's degree and, and the cost of college education just overall, how do you see programs like P-TECH serving as a model to the future of college education? Well, first of all, the students get their two-year degree without paying a nickel for it. So that's one important component here. Uh, the students are taking their college courses while they're on the high school register. It's less costly to provide it, and the students are getting their associate's degree with zero debt. And then they have a choice. They can go into the workforce and take those jobs in cybersecurity or biotech or green jobs, and they can get north of $50,000 entry-level salaries. Or the student can decide that they want to go on and get their four-year degree. And that's where we're not limiting the opportunity. You know, when P-TECH first started, there were some people who were saying, oh, you're pushing students into jobs with only a, an associate's degree. But actually, if you look at the results in the first P-TECH school, and now P-TECH schools all over the United States, the majority of students are, are going on and getting their four-year degrees uh, without any debt. And then you're saving all the money on remedial courses. You know, last year, 68% of the students who registered in a community college were taking non-credit-bearing remedial courses. This is a ridiculous cost. You got a high school diploma, you're not able to take a credit-bearing course, so you have to pay the tuition cost for taking remedial courses. You can wipe that cost out for all of the students. Uh, but I like, you know, there are a number of people who have started to say over the last couple of years, college doesn't matter. You've heard it, people writing about it. You don't really need to worry about getting a college degree. Remember that 84% increase in earning for somebody with a post-secondary degree. Do you know a large number of middle-class Americans who are saying to their son, or daughter, don't worry, you don't have to go to college. That, that's not happening. So it shouldn't happen for low-income kids, and it shouldn't happen for kids of color. College does, it, does matter, and it's the right kind of degree with the right kind of pathway, and that's what P-TECH represents. It's interesting, though. You know, I think that the notion of connecting to an employer that is going to give you a job after two years is really appealing to. I mean, I know it's appealing to me. Um, you know, uh, and and that's a kind of a pushback against uh, credentials that don't actually get you that, right? I mean, there's a lot of mid middling four-year programs where you can spend seventy thousand dollars a year and um, you know not come out very employable. Um, which you I know, I think what one of the things that, that people don't really understand is that large numbers of young people who are first-generation college goers and they come through the P-TECH program, they have a mentor. They have somebody who is communicating with them on a regular basis online. They're visiting with them and they're providing them with the same kind of supports that middle-income and upper-income students get from people at home, from their family, from their relatives uh, who have that kind of opportunity. And students begin by getting that mentoring and support starting in grade nine. You know, wh when we offer the internships at the P-TECH program, it's the summer between junior and senior year in high school. So, you know, a lot of employers hadn't really had an experience of offering internships for students who are still in high school. But what they found is that the students were not only you know, ready for the internship, but they were learning on the job, and that's why they developed relationships, and that was how the students got you know, the job offers when they graduated. Other questions here? Uh, recently, there was a convention of business leaders and CEOs, like 300 of them, and they were asked a question, and the question was, what is the biggest problem you have running your business today and making it grow successfully? And the answer was unanimously, an undereducated workforce. Exactly. Every survey, <laughs> Fortune 500 companies, you name it, they say that uh, people that we're hiring lack writing skills, problem-solving skills, and what students in the P-TECH schools get 
is they get a strong academic curriculum, as, as Rana pointed out, but they also get it combined with those, what people used to call soft skills, which I would prefer to call essential skills, problem solving, writing, presentation. We brought Kathy Hochul when she was Lieutenant Governor of New York State to visit the P-TECH school in Newburgh. And she met a young girl who was in the ninth grade. And she asked her, tell me one thing you learned in this P-TECH school that was unique or different. And the girl looked at Kathy and said, I learned how to do an elevator pitch. <laughs> and uh, the Lieutenant Governor at the time, now the Governor said, what's an elevator pitch? <laughs> and the girl said, you don't know what an elevator pitch is? And she said, yes, I do know, but you explain it to me. And this 13-year-old girl said, when you have a complicated piece of information to communicate and you want somebody to agree with you, you have to sit down and think about how you're going to communicate that in only five minutes. The reason it's five minutes is because the elevator is going to get from your floor to the ground floor. We walked out after it was over and the now governor said, that girl's amazing, <laughs> 13 years of age. And that kind of problem solving, communication is stressed in all the classes, not just the workplace skills, but you visit a P-TECH school and you walk in and you'll see students problem solving, working in groups, and they're learning the workplace skills while they're learning their academics. Okay, question over here. Thank you. I have a question, actually two questions from some attendees who are joining us virtually. The first is from Gary Beach. He says, Stan, you mentioned President Macron of France wants to spread P-TECH model everywhere in the country. That's probably easier in France because it has a centralized national education ministry. Here in the US, we are tethered to 13,800 school districts. Does that make it more difficult to scale P-TECH in America? Yeah, it, it makes it difficult if it's not a federal kind of an initiative. On the other hand, Look at the leadership that we have in red states and blue states. You know, uh, P-TECH growing in Colorado, P-TECH growing in Rhode Island, P-TECH growing in Texas and Louisiana. So there's no, yes, it's a challenge because we have, low, we have 700 school districts in New York State. Uh, you know, we have the same challenge here just locally in New York State. So yes, it's a bigger challenge than having somebody at the top just say, you know, we're gonna do it. But we can do this, and we started it here. A question from Alyssa Sandy. Alyssa says, I actually am an early P-TECH graduate who went on to get a four-year degree after graduating. What is the process to get back into a partnered company after graduating from obtaining a ba bachelor's, or is there a set process to get into a partnered company? Alyssa Sandy was not only a graduate of P-TECH, but she was a champion uh, in sports. She was a champion uh, uh, athlete, and she's a great young woman, and Alyssa, contact me and I'll be happy to help you. <laughs> uh, I think there would be many employers that would be looking to hire somebody with Alyssa's skills. Couple more questions here. Stan, I'm Tim Creamer. <laughs> Haven't seen you in a while. Yeah. Good to see you again. Uh, I'm on the school board in a small upstate school district, and what you're, I'm a big disciple of P-TECH, so you don't have to convince me, but I need to convince a lot of other people. And we're in this small school district that once was a feeder into, I would say, college prep. That's changing, and I think we've heard some things about costs and expectations and things like that. And I talk to a lot of my constituents who talk about the fact that I don't want to say lower your expectations or reset your expectations, but it may be that my child would be better off finding something that would lead to a skill that would lead to a job. So the model you're talking about is perfect. I need to somehow introduce this in a small school district. Are there people who can help me do that? There are people who could help you do that. There is a New York State P-TECH coordinator, uh, Diallo Shabazz. I think he's on. Uh, I think he's on Zoom. And Tim, I will send you to Diallo. Uh, there is a piece of state legislation that was introduced in the New York State Senate by Senator Shelley Mayer, 
It passed uniformly with Democrat and Republican support. Uh, it has now been introduced in the Assembly by Assemblywoman Hunter from Syracuse, which has a large number of successful P-TECH schools. That bill passes, it gets signed into law. There's an opportunity to do two, three, four more rounds of RFPs and select additional schools, and your district should apply, and they can get the planning grant, and they can get it off the ground. The New York State Business Council has been a huge supporter of P-TECH and all of their members, and they've got large numbers of districts around the state where they have small businesses that are members of the New York State Business Council who partner and collaborate, so that could be done. Tim Kramer, by the way, was the head of the New York State Business Council, I'm sorry, the New York State School Boards Association, all the school boards in 700 districts in New York State. And with your support, we can do it in that district, and we can also spread it all across the state. Happily retired. I have absolutely no authority <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, I'm on the school board in one school district. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe one more question before we give you all some wine and let you uh, ask Stan some more questions over, over that or or oh, over here. Hi, uh, Richard Riggins, director, managing director of career and wellness services at the door. Uh, center of Alternatives, and so I'm asking for non-traditional schools. I'm here representing nonprofits that have or exist within the realm of having a high school uh, that exists within a nonprofit. And so I guess one of my questions is how would I be able to think about or how should I approach replicating something like P-TECH within our school environment? Because I think that, uh, Stan, I'm so proud of you. Uh, first, I want to say that. Um, and we've had many discussions about this, but I want to find out if we could speak further about how I could replicate something like this. And I know that there are other people that would love Mark Levine's backing as well uh, in finding and sourcing funding on how to replicate this within the city, within non-traditional schools like mine, where the young people that exist there are not unlike the young people that exist within the school system, but that are essentially sort of thrown away or forgotten about. And so I'm here for the forgotten kid. And the answer is there's no barrier that would stand in the way of doing exactly what you asked about in your question. Right now, a number of major philanthropic sources, including the Gates Foundation, are interested in providing philanthropic support to start more P-TECH-like schools. Uh, they may call it something else, but that's what they want to do. Uh, the Lumina Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, the Bloomberg Foundation, all interested in this kind of a model. And with the expansion in New York State and planning grants made available once this legislation passes, there'll be additional opportunities. But I also think with the political leadership, we have the opportunity to do in New York what Texas did. What they did, the legislature took $120 million of what they got in COVID relief funds, and they focused it and targeted it specifically on workplace development grants across the state of Texas. And they allocated 40 million of that 120 million for PTEC expansion in the state of Texas. What they are doing in Texas is not beyond our ability to do in New York or for the state of Colorado or Connecticut or New Jersey or all of the other examples. You know, one of the things that I wrote about in the book was take down the barriers. You know, if you think just because something hasn't been done, it's never going to be able to be done, that's nonsense. But think clearly. Don't do it in a way that can't be replicated. Take down the barriers for replication once you begin. There's nothing standing in the way. Dallas has a P-TECH in every one of their comprehensive high schools. New York City could do the same. Wow. The book is called Breaking Barriers. Um, Stan, you have done an amazing job with this. You rock. Rashid, you rock. You guys rock for coming. Um, and the bar is open, I think. So <laughs> thanks. Thank you.